there was this woman who I really liked. She's much, she was older. She was like in her 90s. And her name was Mary Lodge. Loved Mary Lodge. And Mary Lodge used to be a teacher. But you know how like after age 80, people kind of do and say whatever they want. And they don't care. Um, and so this priest is giving this homily. And this priest, he's a good priest. But honest to God, he could bore paint. Um, and he's talking for like 20 minutes and literally saying nothing, but, you know, talking and talking. And this was kind of shocking. Mary Lodge raises her hand, which I love. Mary Lodge raises her hand. And he says, well, yes, Mary, can I help you? And she says, Father, what's your point? <laughs> he has to say, well, I don't have a point. I'm just giving background, just make a point. <laughs> so, you know, not that I want to encourage that, but, um, you know, what, what I like is that she was a very fierce Catholic, and I love that. But I also love the fact that, you know, she knew when there was no point being made. She knew that there wasn't any substance in what was being said. You know, a lot of rules but no substance. And I just meant that because in the gospel and the first reading, you have this theme of authority, that, you know, he speaks with authority. Technically, the Greek says he speaks with substance, which actually has an important meaning. Um, and what I liked about Mary is that Mary could hear when somebody was speaking with substance or it was a waste. Um, not giving up a Catholicism, but... There's just no substance there. And so when it says he speaks with authority, that has a great meaning. And it starts with the first reading where Moses, a little background, Deuteronomy, this is a big, big theme. Deuteronomy, um, God wants to teach the people, wants to teach and show them a new way of life. But when God speaks, it scares them. So they ask for an intercessor. So Moses... He's going to go up the mountain and get the words of God. But Moses tells him that God said, well, um, I am a prophet. And let's face it, Moses is the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. He says, I am a prophet. But since you're not ready to really learn the ways of God, um, one day the prophet will come and the prophet will will have greater authority than me and bring you a new teaching and a new morality. And so the point being is that um, after that, there are always waiting for the prophet to come with a new teaching, with a new teaching of authority, and he will be greater than Moses. And so they wait for that. Now, um, God will send them many prophets, or like John the Baptist will say, when they ask him, he'll say, no, no, I am a prophet, but I am not the prophet. And so, in today's gospel, this is a gospel from Mark, and it's the beginning of the gospel of Mark. And the beginning of the gospel of Mark, this is the first miracle. And always in the gospels, whatever gospel it is, the first miracle kind of defines what Christ is going to do. So, like, in the gospel of um, John, the gospel of John... The first miracle is actually the, multiple, uh, the blessing of the water into wine. And like that means something. Um, like, no offense, do you guys know who Diane Oatman is? Um, if you know, that would be her gospel. Because, um, well, it's a, well, it's kind of true. Because if you know Diane, um, the first miracle happens at a wedding. It's this celebration of love. God, Christ makes this overflow of wine, which symbolizes... His miracle that there's going to be an overflow of love in the world. You know, that, that would fit Diane. This one actually fits me. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, it starts with um, Jesus' first miracle happens in church, in the synagogue. Now, that, that should strike you as strange. And the miracle is him confronting this unclean spirit. And you should ask yourself, holy cow, what is a demon, an unclean spirit, doing in church? That, would, that doesn't make any sense. And the reason why is that um, in the Gospel of Mark, 
Mark is going to purify religion. Mark is, he's going to have this fight between good and evil. And you have to choose what side you're on, good or evil. And there's going to be a fight. And Christ, he's going to reform religion. He's going to change religion. And so he preaches, and the people say exactly what Moses predicted about this new prophet. And the people are shocked. And literally in Greek it says that they're knocked out like a punch. They're knocked out with amazement. And say, in English it says, he teaches with authority, not like the scribes and the priests. Um, he teaches with substance. Um, that's what Moses predicted. And the odd part is this. Think about this. Even the demons can hear his Christ authority and say, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? And the answer is yes. Um, the demons can hear that authority. And the crowds of people, some of them, when Christ speaks, they can hear authority. And the other part is, some of them can't. Like the Pharisees. They can't hear Christ speak with authority. So my question is this. Why is it some people can hear words of authority and other people can't? Um, that's, that's a really odd question because if you're going to learn the ways of the prophet, this new morality, you have to kind of be able to hear with substance. And there's this belief in Catholicism called the hierarchy of truths. And I know I've talked about this before, but... I really wish people would get this. We as Catholics, Catholics and Jews, believe in a hierarchy of truths. And I'm just going to go lightly over this, but does anybody remember me talking about this before? Did anybody fall asleep? Okay. Um, so let's say I'm playing uh, poker with the Schmitz, some Schmitz, just Schumachers. Um, and um, I have, let's say he has four of a kind, and I have a royal flush. Who's going to win? Me, because I always win. Um, so that's a higher... Some things are more important than others. And in Catholicism, we list it out that there's dogma. And if, let's say, you become, somebody becomes Catholic, they, from another religion, they make this promise that they believe in Catholic dogma. Um, we believe dogma comes from Christ. That everything Christ taught his apostles, that's what we call dogma. The second thing... It's low, and we'd say that's, that's a must. The second thing is doctrine. Doctrine are things we believed for 2,000 years, but technically Jesus never demanded that we believe those. Like, how many books are in the Bible? Christ never, you know, that's a, a doctrine. You can disagree, like, um, I don't know, like, let's say Shaq doesn't like one of the letters of Paul. Um, that, no, okay, whatever, Shaq. But that doesn't make him not Catholic. And, like, just mentioning that, like, the second reading, which you did a very good job, the second reading Paul mentions about, um, this is very true, you know, wives are just, they live with anxiety whether their husbands are happy. Um, I don't know if that's really that true, but um, <laughs> even Paul later says you shouldn't get married. I would question whether you should take marriage advice to some Paul who was never married. Um, just saying, uh, but like, that's doctrine, but that's not dogma. Nowhere did Christ demand it. And the largest body is teaching, and teaching is the opinion of popes and bishops. And they are morally obligated to give their position. But we openly admit that... Uh, teachings may be wrong. You're obligated to listen to them. But popes and bishops have not always taught the right thing. Um, that they've been wrong. But we'd say, you have to listen to it. And the bottom, the very basement, is Catholic disciplines. And Catholic disciplines, we openly admit, listen, Jesus doesn't even care. Catholic disciplines is like, what color of uh, robe the priest should wear, which sometimes I've made the mistake. Um, Jesus really doesn't care. We do it for good order. Or um, once at one mass, um, somebody forgot to light the candles. Well, I, that's all right. We're fine. Um, and I got this scathing email about how the candles weren't lit. That's somebody do that doesn't have a hierarchy of truths. You know, that somehow um, 
uh, you know, the Eucharist and candles being lit are on the same level. That's a flat hierarchy. We have a hierarchy of truth. Some things are really important. They have substance. And other things don't. And I just mention that because so much pain has been caused because people can't hear authority. And I mentioned the, the guy a couple of months ago who died and, you know, called for a priest and he regrets that he's been away from the Catholic Church for years, but he disagreed with his bishop on something and therefore didn't feel like he had the right to go to communion. Um, you know, that's, he had a flat hierarchy. Does that make any sense? Like, um, like take Mary Lodge. The priest can be saying nothing and it doesn't upset her faith. It just, like, she doesn't, does that make any sense? Even, I bet you with Mary Lodge, if the bishop said something she disagreed with, it wouldn't ruin her faith. Does that make sense? Like, um, and if we're at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, uh, we're the ones who want to be able to learn a new teaching, a new morality, you have to be able to hear what's important and what's not. And, you know, I just, I love this, where it says that his words have substance, how that's a very Catholic thing is that his words have substance. Where that word substance comes up again is, or will come up again today, is actually in the Lord's Prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, um, you don't pray for give us each day our daily bread. In the Greek, you pray for epiousios, the bread of, it, this is not going to make sense in Greek, the bread of the substance of life. So not only does, he, does his words have substance, but he's also going to give us the bread of the substance of life. Both his words and sacraments have substance. And my point is this. Why is it some people, they can hear Christ speak with authority, and other people, they can't hear it? In the Gospel of Mark, if you're going to learn the ways of the prophet, this new morality, we are the ones who have to have the hearts that are so sensitive that we can hear the substance of God's word and know when there is no substance.